Welcome to the Nature Journal Connection. I'm your host, John Muir Laws. Today, I want to share with you four tricks that will help you draw more quickly and accurately and easily. These are tricks that I use all the time when I'm making scientific illustrations or a quick sketch in my journal. Before we do, though, we have to have a talk. Because the danger of me saying, look, here's some tricks that will help you with your drawings, is some people might start to interpret that as me saying, it's important that you have pretty pictures in your journals. And it's really not about that at all. If you get a pretty picture in your journal, that's great. If it's not a pretty picture, that's great. Whether it's a pretty picture or not doesn't make a difference. We're using our journals the way that scientists use them. We want that picture or that diagram to be useful. So if in the process of making that sketch, I notice something that I otherwise wouldn't have noticed, or can remember it more vividly, or making that sketch or that diagram just made me think differently about whatever object it was, independent of whether it's a pretty picture or not, that drawing is useful to me. So what we're going to do is let go of the whole idea of making pretty pictures. If you get a pretty picture, that's fine. If not, that's fine. We want pictures that are useful though. And Here's an interesting thing that happens. If you let go of the idea of having to make a pretty picture and you just start making lots of pictures, you get better and better and better at drawing really fast. You see, drawing is a skill. It's not a gift that some people have and some people don't. It's a skill that you develop by making lots of pictures. The more you do, the faster you're gonna develop that skill. What happens inside our head is that our brain responds to and grows with the work that we do. So if you're repeating something and struggling with it, your brain is going, ooh, this is hard. And because of that struggle, it's going to be laying down new neural connections. Your brain will be growing denser and larger giving you networks in your brain that help you master these new skills. So you actually change the shape of your brain by the work that you do. And so if I am making lots of pictures and I do it again and again and again, the first time, maybe if I haven't drawn in a long time, the first time I do it, my little brain is really struggling. It's going like, like oh, this is hard. All right. And I just kind of like, all right, I'm going to work through it. You get to the other side. Then you make another drawing and your brain goes, like, oh, look, he's doing it again. This is hard. And so then I do it again. The next time I do it, what happens is my brain says, all right, you know, you keep doing this drawing thing. So I'm going to just have to make this easier for myself. And I'm going to lay down, because you keep making me work, I'm going to actually lay down new neural connections inside my brain around this activity of looking at something and moving my pencil and drawing a picture of it. So you've triggered your brain to build new structures around this skill of drawing because I'm pushing my brain just a little bit outside of its comfort zone. It's that repetition with effort that signals my brain to go like, oh, let's build some new structures. So then what happens is it builds those and the next time I go to draw, it's like, oh, it's a little bit easier. My, the, the connection between my eye, my hand, my pencil, my brain, it's just a little bit more smooth and that drawing works better. And then what I do is I just, I then push it a little again. I challenge my brain to do something that's a little bit more difficult. My brain's like, oh, we're working again. Yep, we are. And so your brain grows and grows and grows and grows. So by constantly sort of pushing that edge where you're just kind of working, you're developing the skill just a little bit outside of your comfort zone, you're going to be changing the shape of your brain really quickly. And the secret is it's that repetition with effort. So putting in a bunch of pencil miles. So drawing is not a gift that some people have and some people don't. It's a skill that we can all develop to a really high degree of technical mastery just by making a whole bunch of drawings.
So that being said, let me show you four techniques that are really going to help you look at something and get it down on your paper. We're gonna be looking at four tricks that will help you draw more quickly and more accurately. The first is starting with a light, loose gesture sketch. This gives you a framework that blocks in the basic proportions and sizes of the different parts of whatever object you're looking at. The second is to use parallel guides. These are sets of parallel lines that will help line up an object that appears on one side of the body with the same structure on the other side of the body, so our drawing doesn't end up lopsided. The third is line variation. This is using lines of different thickness or darkness to help show the structure of whatever object you're drawing more clearly. The fourth is a three-step process for drawing shadows that will help you capture the structure of your object more clearly. Before you start any drawing, look carefully at your subject. Take some time to look at the sizes of the different shapes and how they attach to each other. You don't want to discover that one part fits into the other in a way that's different than you originally thought when you're halfway through your drawing. You'll end up having to erase a bunch of lines that you had put in. If you can make those discoveries before you begin to draw, your process will be easier. Our first drawing technique is to start with a gesture sketch. A gesture sketch is a light, loose drawing that blocks in the basic shapes of whatever object you're illustrating. We're going to make a bunch of lines and we're gonna make them loosely and as, with as pale marks as we can. If you press hard and you make bold, deliberate lines at this stage, your mind will lock onto those lines and say, like, I drew this really heavily, so it must be right. This is just a scaffolding for other lines that will come after it. I often make these sorts of gesture sketches with the most pale colored pencil in my collection. I usually use a light blue colored pencil. For this demonstration, I'm using a darker pencil so that you can see my marks on the screen. But if I was using the pencil that I normally use, you wouldn't be able to see these marks at all. They're that pale. These ghost lines, you're not even going to have to erase them when you're done. And we'll be building the rest of the drawing on top of this scaffolding, on top of this framework. As you make these lines, Pay attention to the sizes of the parts, their distances from each other, how wide they are, and how they attach into each other. Our second technique is to use sets of parallel guides. These are lines oriented in the same direction that can help me line up features that are on one side of my skull or whatever object I'm drawing with that same structure on the other side of the skull. So for instance, if I want the cheekbones to line up at the same height on either side of the skull, a line going across the skull will help me place those accurately. And then using a line that is oriented in the same direction, I can make a guideline that can help me get in the bottom of the cheekbone or the base of the skull. That way all the parts of my skull will line up with each other and my drawing will be more symmetrical. Our third technique is line variation. This strategy can help all the drawings that you do. Instead of using one line weight or thickness or darkness of your line. Train yourself to sometimes use heavier, more bold lines and sometimes use light lines. I can use the heavy lines to show the edges of major structures or features. I can also often use a heavier line on parts of my object that are closer to the viewer. I will use thin light lines 
to draw in fine little details like the cracks on this skull. But if all the lines were the same thickness on this drawing, the drawing would be much more visually confusing. One strategy that a lot of illustrators use is they will make most of their drawing with a medium weight line and then come over that drawing and punch in a few of the lines just to add in some extra variation. And then at the end, they go back and drop in the finest, smallest details using very light hair lines. You can get different sorts of line weights in your drawing by pressing more forcefully with your pencil. That gives you a thicker line, it gives you a darker line. So practice sometimes making a bold line, sometimes making a light line, and intentionally use that line variation in your drawing. This will make whatever illustration you do much more clear and easy to understand. Technique number four is using the three-step shadow technique. This is a way of carving shadows across your object in a way that will reveal the structure of whatever you are drawing more accurately. We're going to divide the lights and the darks on our object into three different steps. One is going to be our light areas. For this, we'll just use the color of the paper. The second will be a middle value, and the third will be our darker shadows. Begin by observing the shape of your lightest area. You can lightly, with a pencil or a pen, carve in along, that, along the side of that shape, and then shade with your middle value all the areas that you want to be in shade. So we're separating the lights from the darks. And most importantly here, you're looking at the shape of those two areas. The third and final step is to punch in the darkest shadow values in a few areas where you see them on your object. But again, you're going to be paying attention to the shape of those shadow areas. So your lightest light, your middle value, and your darkest darks are shapes rather than a random blending from light to dark. This helps you notice the structure and be able to record that on your piece of paper more accurately. Those strategies together are really going to help you be able to draw what you see. And that is your challenge for this week. What I'd like you to do in your journal is just put in a whole bunch of pencil miles with drawing. We're gonna really, in our journal entry, we're still using words, pictures, and numbers, but really gonna push this idea of using those, of making a lot of drawings. And during this, you may find that that little kind of gremlin pops up on your shoulder and starts going like, like oh, this doesn't quite look right, right? And kind of starts to stress you out about having to make this look pretty. Should that happen, what you do is you just turn to that little voice and you say like, hey, <clears throat> I'm actually nature journaling over here, so it's not about making pretty pictures. It's all about observing and noticing and, and remembering. And that's, that's what I'm doing. So, um, uh, you know, have a good day. But uh, I don't really need you right now. The little voice will like, oh, sorry, I thought you were like, ooh, like art or something, and it goes away. So you're able to make just a bunch of drawings unencumbered by that little nuisance. See what happens when you free yourself from having it to be a pretty picture and you just make lots of pictures. Remember, as scientists, we're interested in a picture that's useful. So if it helps you observe, remember, connect, or think about whatever object is in front of you, your drawing is successful. And until next time, this is your Nature Journal Connection. Do, do, do.